Welcome to this episode of Revolution and Ideology. I'm Nick. I'm Jared. In this episode, we are discussing the 1976 Hungarian film, The Fifth Seal. So I randomly came across some article on the internet, which I'll link in the notes, titled, These are some of the most nihilistic movies ever made. And I think it was a list of eight or something. And I had seen a couple of it, a couple of them, but I had not seen this one. So I decided, why not? I downloaded it, found it online and watched it. It's called The Fifth Seal. It was directed by a Hungarian director by the name of Zoltan Fabri, which, by the way, is a dope name, um, in 1976. This is the log line, if you've never heard of it, which I have to assume most people haven't. But it says, in Budapest in 1944, a watchmaker, a bookseller, and a carpenter are drinking in a bar with the owner when they are joined by a stranger. The watchmaker asks a hypothetical question that will change their lives. So... I mean, yeah, that's basically it. There, there's a what lot of church. philosophy here. You know, the the whole film revolves basically around one main question that they ask themselves and then ends with another, you know, ethical quandary that they find themselves in. Uh, what do you have? Oh, I said Budapest. You got to pronounce it correctly. Right. Since it seems yeah. like everyone's all up in our like business about like our mispronunciations. Right. Yeah. Budapest. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, I, my Hungarian is non-existent. It's, it's well, not even yeah, bad. It's, it the the irony is they'll always come at us with our mince pronunciations in like yeah. like the worst like grammar like grammar comments. You can mm-hmm. probably yeah, it's, there's an <laughs> irony to that, but whatever. Yeah. Um, so the film takes place be during the rule of the Arrow Cross. Uh, they ruled just a little history about why these guys are dealing with what they end up dealing with. Uh, they ruled between about October 1944 and January 1945. If you've never heard of the Arrow Cross, they were a Hungarian, I mean, there's no way to describe them other than fascist, straight up fascist movement um, that ruled. They were in power for, like I just said, three to four months, really, um, a really short period of time. But during that time, they did absolutely horrific, horrific things. Depending on the numbers you look at, they slaughtered anywhere between 15,000 and 40,000 Jews. Keep in mind, I just said they ruled for three, like four months at most. In right. that time, they killed between 50,000 and 40,000 Jews. And they oversaw the deportation of 80,000 Jews to labor and death camps. So like this was a horrific group of human beings, uh, to say the least. They would just line people up by the dozens on the edge of the Danube, make them take their shoes off because their shoes were valuable, and then just execute them and push their bodies in the river. If you ever go to Budapest, there's actually a memorial there called Shoes on the Danube that is a tribute to, you know, these people that lost their lives and et cetera. Uh, They were eventually defeated once the Red Army reached Budapest uh, in the Battle of Budapest in January of 1945. Interesting, when I was in Budapest, we stayed at this hotel that was like basically downtown and there's a little park uh, square like right by our apartment. And there was a memorial to the Red Army for freeing them from the rule of the Arrow Cross, which is interesting. So the film takes place in Budapest during this time, and it starts out, like the log line says, is four friends sitting around in a bar uh, drinking and talking. But since it's in the middle of World War II and the Iron Cross is uh, in power in their city, they're basically sitting with uh, all the lights off except for one, and all the windows are blacked out to prevent uh, being able to see from like air raids and et cetera. So this is like the milieu in which the film takes place. Um, and so there's four people a uh, bar owner, a carpenter, and the book salesman, and a watchmaker, plus then uh, eventually walks in this photographer who is wounded. He has just returned from the front lines of the war. So they talk for a while. Uh, Jared's main complaint that he told me about yesterday was that uh, it's much too long of them sitting in a bar talking, but you know, whatever it is, what it is. Um, and eventually the watchmaker poses a philosophical question to the group, and this is what leads, uh, you know, it's really the engine of what keeps the movie going. Um, And so this is his like hypothetical situation. He says that there is a monarch named Tomo Kudsata Tiki. I'm never going to pronounce that again. So we'll just say like Tatiki for this like ruler of this island. Or just say the monarch is what my plan was. Yeah, I'm not going to say monarch because I'm I'm not going to recreate that. Not even going to try. Yeah. Anyway, this guy. He rules an island, and he has a slave named Gyugyu. The slave suffers many traumas at the hands of the monarch, to like put it uh, lightly, I guess. So the watchmaker is telling this story that 
his tongue was cut out, his teenage daughter was taken from him and given to the monarch as a present, and the monarch ends up killing her. His teenage uh, son, I guess not teenage, but his slave son was taken and given to a different lord. So both of his children are taken away by this monarch. The nose of his wife gets cut off as punishment to the slave. One of the slave's eyes was cut out at one point, etc. So this is all the story the watchmaker is telling him to his friends. This monarch is like a, an atrocious human being who uh, owns this slave and treats him poorly, obviously. The slave consoles himself every night by telling himself that his life was better than the monarch's because he was not the one that was committing these atrocities, right? These crimes against uh, other humans. And so his con conscience is clear. He has a clear conscience and believes that his existence is the best because he's not the one's committing, one committing these atrocities. And so it's important to point out that his conscience is actually clear, but it's not that he's just telling him himself to like justify his life. He truly like believes this, right? The monarch also has a clear conscience because he genuinely believes that he is following the morals of the time. He genuinely believes that he is doing nothing wrong. So he doesn't believe that his actions are wrong. He, there's no like ethical quandary that he has in his mind. The way that he's treating the slave is completely justified. So both of these men, the monarch and the slave, have clear consciences. Okay. In uh, in the middle of this, their debate gets interrupted because a couple of officers from the Arrow Cross come in to the bar and the bar owner gives one of them a drink and then they leave. That's basically it. But they come in and the men complain once they leave, like they call them bastards, I think, and dirty murderers or whatever, right? as you would, obviously, uh, behind their back once they left the bar. Uh, that's only important for a plot point uh, in a few minutes. So as they're getting ready to leave for the night, they're packing up, putting their coats on. Um, the photographer says, you know, I can, oh, sorry. I forgot to pose the question. The watchmaker's question is, <laughs> yeah, that's if you're going part. to be reincarnated, yeah, this is kind of important. If you're going to be reincarnated as either the monarch or the slave with zero memory of your current life, which would you choose? Would you choose to be the slave and have a life of suffering? Or would you choose to be the monarch and be the oppressor? Keep in mind, they both have clear consciences and the monarch genuinely believes, like we said, that he is doing nothing wrong ethically whatsoever. So the friends debate this for a long time. And as they're leaving, the photographer finally says, you know, I have an answer. I would choose to be reincarnated as the slave. And he doesn't really actually provide that much justification. That's really all he says. And the friends like make fun of him and call him a liar, basically, you know, and he takes offense and they almost get in a fight, but then they don't and they leave. And that's kind of the end of that scene. They all leave the bar and we learn a little bit about each of them uh, that night once they leave the bar and go off and do their own thing. So the book salesman goes to his mistress's house and gets basically wasted. Um, he imagines himself as the monarch. And then the next morning he's walking home and he declares that he would choose to be reincarnated as the monarch. And then he passes out. He blacks out drunk in the middle of the street. So that's the book salesman. The carpenter goes home and him and his wife, he agonizes all night over this question. He can't sleep. He's up and down. Like this is really, really bothering him. And his wife actually says at one point, you know, I would choose to come back as the monarch. We have suffered enough. And like our generations of our family have suffered enough. Like I would be the monarch. And this isn't good enough for the carpenter. He still um, thinks about it a, a long time and then eventually decides that he would come back as the monarch as well. So that's his conclusion sort of as the end of the night. The bar owner goes home and he has an interesting back and forth with his wife. He's basically doing his books, his accounts. And he's talking about, you know, I need to buy some more alcohol for because the fascists drank it, right? That's one thing he says, et cetera. And then he talks about how he's going to pay tribute to one of the local fascist leaders and him and his wife get in a debate about this. And he says, you know, it's better that we pay the small amount of money and stay on their good side so that, you know, bad things don't happen to us and our family. She says, you know, this isn't okay. It's not ethically okay. We shouldn't be doing this. Um, so they get in a little bit of an argument about that. Then he says, okay, well, we'll also pay some family. The husband got killed by the fascist and he was a communist. So he says, okay, we'll also pay into a fund an, an account for this widow. That way, if the socialists show up, the Soviets, will be covered, right? Basically, he's playing both sides 
so that if the fascists, uh, he'll pay off the fascists, and if the Soviets happen to come up to liberate them, which we all know that they do later, then he'll have that side covered too. So basically, he's playing both sides. Um, he doesn't actually answer the question. Uh, I guess does he does, right? He would want to be the monarch. That's what he concludes at the end, because he says, I want to live, and I want to live with you, like with his wife. The watchmaker, we learn a lot about him. He is a widower. His wife has died. It doesn't say how she's died. And he is harboring Jewish orphans in his house. So he has a room with a bunch of beds in it. They're all kids that are asleep. And him and his daughter are basically taking care of them. And at one point, someone comes in the middle of the night and gives him another child whose parents have just been killed. So he's basically like the moral noble, I guess, uh, in this case, even though he's the one that has asked the troubling question. Okay. So let's pause for a second at our point in the movie and pose this question. If you were to be reincarnated with no recollection of your current life, would you choose to be reincarnated as the monarch or as the slave? So we need to like reiterate the qualifiers here. So mm -hmm. we're, we're, before you put it in the comments, we need to reiterate the qualifiers. The monarch is a horrific person by our current morals um, and ethical mm -hmm. standards, has done a whole host of horrific things to the slave that Nick outlined above, um, but has a complete clear conscience about it. Doesn't feel anything, doesn't even realize what they've done is wrong. The slave, on the other hand, um, is the one that has been abused um, and is rationalizing all of the abuse um, based on the fact that he's not the one doing these things. And that's what gives him a clear conscience that he is the victim. And somehow his suffering is, is purifying the fact that these bad things are happening. Mm -hmm. Um, and the question is being posed to these four different individuals. And of course, to myself and Nick, we're going to kind of go through it as well, as well as you, the, the viewers or listeners, which would you be again, neither you're going to feel guilt in neither case. So which mm -hmm. would, we choose. Would we choose to be um, the oppressor or the oppressed? I mean, it's that simple. So Nick, what do you think? I mean, I'm going to take the cop-out answer first, which is I think that we are all... So the friends conclude that like it's impossible to answer to be the slave. Like You're a liar if, the, if you answer that, right? Because the photographer Correct. says he would be the slave, and they're like, yeah, you're full of shit, right? I somewhat agree with them on that. I, re I, yeah, I, I, I actually say it, agree, but I honestly too. do. Yeah. And the reason that I agree is because I think that we're all the monarchs now, already. We're already the monarchs. Correct. Like, do we own yeah. slaves and are we poking their eyes out? Like, absolutely not. But are we doing things today that we think are completely fine, that we don't even question, that people in the future will undoubtedly be like, oh, my God, how are they violating, you know, others' human rights? How could they possibly not question the morality of these decisions that they were making? There is zero doubt in my mind that that will happen in the future, right? That we will be looked back upon as like morally horrific human beings. Mm -hmm. So we're already the monarchs, right? Like you can make whatever choice you want in this hypothetical question, but we're already all the monarchs is my answer. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I also agree with you on that point. Like there is definitely a spectrum of like horrificness mm -hmm. that you try and limit as, as much horrific things as possible. I think most of us with some sort of ethical or moral understanding in a larger context try and yet even try as we might because of like the systems at play and the ideologies of, of the people that we surround ourselves with. It's very difficult um, to do that. I struggle with it every day. I can't go to the store and buy a pair of jeans without thinking about like, oh my mm -hmm. God, like I've just like at some point in the chain and the production of these jeans, someone is suffering because mm -hmm. uh, apparently four pair of jeans is not enough. I need five, right? Like, so like right. it's somewhere along the line there is suffering and there's, and it, it reminds me a little bit of that stupid show, um, uh, The Good Life. Or the good place, mm -hmm. excuse me, the good place, the good place, mm -hmm. where the ultimate conclusion after all of these seasons of the show is that like, I mean, I guess it's not the ultimate conclusion, but it's about halfway through the show that they realize that like everybody is being sent to hell or the bad place because in modern society, there is no matter what choice you make, it is a bad choice through mm -hmm. your consumption habits, through the way you live your life. So that's just, I mean, we're the monarch. We are the monarch. Um, if you haven't watched The Good Place, Jared just spoiled the entire show for you. So sorry about that. If you haven't watched this, The Good Place at this point, um, and it's not even like that amazing a show, so don't waste your time. I, yeah, I spoiled it for you so you don't have to watch hours upon hours of, uh, you know, 
I mean, it's it's okay. Ted Danson's funny. Um, what, we're way off topic here. Let's get back to the, the question here. <laughs> so to go to corroborate what you're saying, I too, unfortunately, even though I try and limit like the, the bad choices I make, you know, I don't eat meat and, you know, I try and only like buy used products and things like that still somewhere along the line. I mean, I was just talking about, it. I got in my car and I wasted a bunch of gas to get mm-hmm. here. I could have walked here, you know, all of these things. Right. So um, sure. I probably, unfortunately, would choose the, the monarch as well. The other thing that I wanted to add to this real quick before we move on, um, and you look at it from the slave perspective, which is, I assume, where you're going next, but is um, the idea, and this is where I come off a little bit strong, especially as, as a history um, instructor and researcher, is that I actually do firmly believe in somewhat of moral and ethical absolutes when it comes to certain topics. I'm a little wishy-washy on it, but... The specific examples used in this of cutting off noses and um, killing daughters after I assume they were sexually assaulted, I actually believe that there is no context in history, no ideological, no material context in which you could actually have a clear conscience about that. So I do like, I do want to push back on that because here's the thing. I will fillet in a U.S. So, yeah, but I part. knew you were going to say that, right? Because yeah. it's an escape. It's escape from the question. But it doesn't yeah. matter because the watchmaker says, right? Part of the, the equation is that he does not believe, legitimately does not believe that he is violating any morals and he has a purely clear conscience. So like, yes, we want the escape of like, I can't believe that. I have to believe that he thinks what he's doing is wrong, but that's not how the watchmaker poses the question. Yeah. And that's why I think the question is flawed. And that's my biggest issue with the question is because I do firmly believe that if you are going to own slaves or kill people or whatever, somewhere in your brain, like I firmly believe, you know, there's something in there in just about every human being. I'm sure there's some psychopaths or sociopaths, whatever, just about every rational human being. This this is not a correct behavior. This is an incorrect behavior. I feel something that is uncomfortable about what I'm doing. I do firmly believe that. So I knew we wouldn't be able to get through the conversation with you taking the ethical out. I mean, well, like I mean, you knew. I mean, you, yes, you watched the movie, <laughs> then 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 told me about the movie, had me watch it, and you already predicted this was going to happen. So here we I, are, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you knew okay, it was going to so happen. Back to the movie. The photographer is so pissed that they made fun of him. Basically, that I guess they don't make fun of him. They just call him a liar, and then almost get in a fight and like whatever. He's so pissed about it that he tells the arrow cross that the four men called them murderers behind their back. We learn this later. So the next night, the four men, their friends, are back at the bar. And all of a sudden, the arrow cross comes in with more officers this time and arrests them all, apprehends all four of the men. They have no idea why. They don't know, right, that the photographer did this to them. The the, uh, four men are taken to, I mean, it's a prison. It's a house, but it's a you know, that they've outfitted as a prison and they're all tortured and beat basically within like an inch of their life, but they have no idea why. Um, they are actually, there's a scene when they're all in the cell together, questioning each other. Like, do you know why we're here? Right. And none of them do. Um, it's interesting though. There's always this subtext of the fact that the watchmaker is harboring the Jews and none of his friends know it. Right. So for all he knows, it could be his fault that they're all there, but he never actually says anything. Uh, which I think is interesting. The watchmaker basically throughout the film is the example of, even though he's the one that poses this ethical quandary that gives them all this angst, he's like the moral hero, right? Throughout the film because he's doing all these things underground, etc. Okay. Do you want to talk about the conversation between the two Arrow Cross officers? I mean, I posed it to you um, electronically outside of our, our scripted notes here, uh, mm-hmm. just because I thought it was somewhat interesting. I mean, I can br- I can raise the question real fast and see what you okay. think of it. It might not yeah. be consequential to the moral quandary we find ourselves in. Mm-hmm. So there is obviously a higher ranking and a lower ranking arrow cross um, officers, right? They're these fascists. And the lower ranking one just wants to kill these four um, individuals and, and, and be done with the thing, uh, be done with the process and go find more people to kill and murder and so on and so forth. The higher ranking officer, however, has another idea. Um, he wants to actually scare the hell out of them, beat them up, and then send them back into society so they spread the story, spread the fear, spread the violence of the Arrow Cross rather than just killing them. That actually leaving them alive does two things. A, it obviously sows seeds of fear and terror among the population, but it also is like, I mean, it's a power play. We are in control and we literally determine whether you live or die. And I do think that's kind of like, there is some commentary there based on the moral question. They are mm-hmm. a more extreme version of the monarch in this case. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think that's what that was. What what 
what the uh, the writers and the director were going for. What do you think now? I mean, this is the more difficult question that 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 arose. If you are the monarch, what do you do? Do you just kill all perceived opposition again, especially if you're going to have the clear conscience, or do you um, threaten and beat and sow seeds of fear and power and allow them to live under the very real? Um, uh, possibility that they will eventually form some sort of resistance and oust you. Because mm-hmm. this is something that's not just unique to this moral question. This is something that has right. been posed um, in our revolution class over and over again. For example, like uh, I'll pick on Cuba because it's an easy one. How did the Batista regime let Castro survive for him to eventually come back and overthrow them, right? Like that's, mm-hmm. you know, those types of things. So what do you think, Nick? What what, what would you do if you were <laughs> this horrific fascist. Yeah, it was a commander. fascist leader. What would yeah, I do? This you is were a fine line of question. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't. I don't know that. Like, <laughs> it has to be specifically a fascist, but like, I mean, it's maybe we don't even have to pose it directly at at each other, but like, it's just something to consider. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's something valid to the guy's argument of, you know, executing everyone only goes so far. Right. We want to instill fear. And the best way to do that, one of the ways to do that is to have these men go back into the general population and spread the stories, right? Yeah. Especially because they have no idea why they were even apprehended in the first place, you know? So I, there's some, clearly something to that. History has played that out many, many, many times. You know what I mean? Right. Like Jared said, that conversation happens between the two uh, Arrow Cross officers And the, I'm assuming, higher ranking officer decides that he has an ethical quandary that he can put them in in as an experiment. So the four of them are brought out into like the foyer of this house, this building. And there is a communist that the Arrow Cross has captured and beaten and he's almost dead. He's beaten that bad and he's roped up and he's hanging there basically by his wrists. And the leader poses to the four men. He says, you are free to go. He actually opens the front door to the building and says, the door is open. You are free to go if you slap this man in the face two times. And this poses, like we said, another ethical, moral question for these men and how each of them reacts. So first, the carpenter who remember before has agonized over the other moral question. He takes a few steps toward the uh, strung up communist as if he's going to slap him, but he ends up just collapsing on the floor and gets drug away by some Arrow Cross officers, presumably to be executed. The bar owner actually steps towards to attack the fascist officer and he gets executed. So in the end, the man that was basically playing both sides in the beginning, uh, I think he takes like the most quote unquote noble reaction, which is to attack the oppressors, right? But he ends up dying. And I think there's a lot of commentary to be had about the futility of this situation and so forth. But that's a whole other conversation. The watchmaker steps up to slap the man, but the book salesman basically jumps on his back to try to stop him. And the arrow cross officers execute the book salesman. So basically he's, he's grabbing the watchmaker to pull him away and they just shoot him. He gets executed and they, uh, that's it. The watchmaker, after agonizing, steps up. He slaps the man two times and he goes free. As he's walking away from the building, so he is freed. The arrow cross officers let him go. He's walking down the street. The building actually ends up getting bombed. And everyone inside dies, presumably. They don't really show it, but the entire building collapses. I don't know how anyone would uh, survive that. And then he runs back. He's running back to his uh, house to uh, presumably see if all of the children are okay and everything. And the film ends. We never see what happens. But that's it. He escapes this whole ordeal. No one else does because he was willing to slap the communist. Next question. If the communist was sure to die, and we have every reason to believe that he was in this case... And you were sure to die if you didn't slap the communist, and we have every reason to believe that you would in this case. Would you slap the communist? Uh, But absolutely. I mean, the watchmaker uh, made the right call. I mean, he's seeing um, the larger picture here, right? You you don't want to miss the forest for the trees, right? Like that old saying. And here we have this idea that... I mean, first and foremost, they probably... If I were directing or writing the film, I I probably would have made it hardcore, more hardcore, rather than slapping you literally had to pull the trigger and execute. I think Mm -hmm. that's actually a little bit more difficult. 
I mean, slapping a guy that's already on death's door, like, yeah, that's not even a question for me. I totally would because in the back of my mind, I know that if I make it out of this home, I have, I don't even remember the number, but let's say uh, mm-hmm. half a dozen to a dozen young Jewish orphans that I'm harboring safely in my house. And I'm going to save each and every one of their lives, whereas this one is not savable, right? So that that one was easy for me. That that wasn't mm-hmm. even, even a debate. And the fact that- Okay. What mm-hmm. if though you didn't have, because I agree, right? It's That's easy. If- I have to slap someone twice or get executed. I'm picking the slapping. Every human being, I think, probably is going to do that unless you're like Mother Teresa or something, right? Like that's I don't know if that's much of a question. Right. What if though you weren't the watchmaker and you didn't have the kids that you were looking after? What if you were just the carpenter with the wife? Then would you do it? I mean, maybe he has kids, whatever. We don't know his whole backstory, but we know that the watchmaker has these kids that he's looking over. What if you were just a single person? Then would you do it? Again, it's just slapping a man. Yes, I I, I might struggle. What if a you had to more. execute him? Let's up the stakes, I guess, because okay, like you I, said, I, right? I, that's a more serious question. I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, uh, yeah, I don't know if you can answer it unless you're in the moment, right? In I the don't moment. Know the answer in the either. moment. Yeah. So, my you know my moral absolutist you know whatever take on it is that you you wouldn't want to execute anybody. Um, but then of course, if you're in the situation, like who knows? Here's the idea, like. I don't know specifically to myself, like what my, I don't know what you'd call it, my self-preservation gene level mm-hmm. is at, right? Like, like you don't know until you're actually in a moment, right? Right. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I can sit here and say uh, to you right now that I would take the, the more noble stand and I would not execute uh, a strung up prisoner um, to save my own life. But I, I, you know, I don't know. My biological imperative to survive might 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 outweigh that if I were actually in the situation, right? Yeah, one hundred percent agree. I think fact, is easy, right? I think everyone would do that. But so the unfortunate part for me, I think, is that it probably would. I probably would w- rather survive. I think we all have that kind of like self preservation mm-hmm. thing. The reason I didn't like this part though of the film is because it's actually it's not it's different. It's a very different moral, moral quandary than the first one, because here's the Mm -hmm. thing, like the monarch and the slave, um, metaphor, the monarch's life is never in danger. This isn't about self-preservation whatsoever. Whereas this Mm -hmm. other one is. So I don't think this is a very apples and oranges. I mean, I think it's about oppression though, right? That's the main point. And the four men are faced with the decision to become the oppressor in order to be free, right? But it's a very, yeah, I mean, it is oppressor and oppression. But again, that now we're on that spectrum again. And in this case, mm-hmm. the spectrum of slapping somebody is not the same as killing daughters and cutting off noses and whatnot. So I, but I do there think is actually would. a huge difference between the, the monarch and the slave and then this final situation because they know that slapping him is wrong, right? It is a violation mm-hmm. of their morals. And so they have to decide whether to violate their morals knowingly in order for to be free themselves or not right in that regard it has like more consequence i think well and then of course the nihilistic part of the film like is that none of this ever even mattered because Mm -hmm. moments later everybody's dead right and i think the other point is that neither answer is right or wrong right whether you slap the guy or don't slap the guy there's no yes or no right it's not a right or wrong absolute most many people would sympathize with you if you slapped the the prisoner to be free. And many people would say, how dare you oppress that man who's done you no wrong, right? There's no right or wrong. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, this is a little Milgram experimenty or Stanford prison mm-hmm. experimenty. Like, like that's kind of the effect we're going for here. Um, at least that's what I assume they're going for here, whether or not they, they the, either of those experiments, I don't remember when, when, Milgram experiment was long since already mm-hmm. done, but I don't remember when the Stanford prison experiment was, was done. It's got to be in the 70s. Maybe. Yeah. I don't it was remember. in the 70s. I don't remember if it was early or late, but this was 76. Right. So, yeah. So, I, and, but even those, those situations I think are, are just a little bit different. I mean, again, mm-hmm. I think it's, it's, it's based on the spectrum of what type of oppression and what type of violence you're willing to exert. So right. anyway. All right. Well, let us know if you've seen the film. If you haven't, I highly suggest you check it out. It was pretty good. Uh, Let us know what you would do in each of those situations uh, in the comments. I'm Nick. I'm Jared. Later.